Oh my gosh, what's up guys? Uh, it's Reed Young, aka Shooter here. I'm going to be going over this uh, this pretty cool 6 max hand. For once, uh, someone posted a hand on 2 plus 2 using the replayer so we can get some animations going on here while I talk about the hand. Um, had a pretty crazy day so far. We've launched the Transform Poker blog and the Transform Poker Facebook page. So I'll put links to both of those in the description below and you guys can check them out just to uh, give you like a little little ghetto mini tour here. Uh, this is what the Facebook page looks like, just the little banner image and our logo. So you guys can check that out. We're going to be putting, uh, you know, blog posts and other fun strategy stuff for you guys to check out while we work on the site. Um, so that'll be there for you guys to peruse at your leisure. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's get into the hand. So this is a, a really cool spot, I think, because it's a, it's a spot where I think a lot of people may not be playing jacks that often um, and aggressively. So the the small blind isn't a full stack, and I think that's, uh, that's definitely something to consider. I think his flatting range is going to be something we can target very well with jacks, and a lot of people in the small blind will be squeezed in this instance and have it fold to them the under the gun player will fold um some of the time and you know sometimes they'll just have a strong enough hand to continue or uh want to rebluff whatever but sometimes the under the gun player is going to fold and the small blind is sitting there looking at his pocket a it's like well screw it i mean he probably just has ace king and then they go with it uh weaker players do that a lot and of course you know combinatorically it's more likely you have ace king but if your range is strong enough, pocket eights are just going to get annihilated here. Most people aren't squeezing lightly in this situation, so it's a bit exploitive in that um, we know the small blind's probably going to be frustrated a bit more often just because that's what weaker players tend to do. So uh, we can get our range accordingly. So squeezing something like tens here, um, sometimes there's instances where you could squeeze as lightly as nines here have a very profitable call against the small blind shove and an easy fold against an under the gun player's shove. So sometimes that can be best, um, you know, it's going to be close between flatting and squeezing in that instance. In my experience, um, just the way the math works out, you guys are welcome to uh, test that probably random sounding statement. But so we go ahead and squeeze. It's a, a bit large for a squeeze, especially because all the stack sizes are below 100 big blinds, or at least uh, the small blinds is. And it looks like maybe ours is a little bit, which is strange. So definitely uh, don't buy them below the maximum if you can avoid it, because you want to exploit those edges and dynamics. And if you're below the maximum, then you're just limiting yourself uh, in that way. There's going to be dynamics you could have with other players that you now won't be able to because of the depth of your stack as limiting your uh, strategic options. So the only time I would say to avoid buying in for the max is if pretty much everyone else at the table has not bought in for the max except for someone to, um, you know, one of the seats to your, close to your left. Because that way you're just going to get pounded on uh, your entire session and you're not going to be able to do much about it. Any uh, hand that you play out of position is going to have a lot of reverse implied odds. Just not a good situation to get yourself into. Anyway, back to the hand. We squeeze. It's a bit large, so I don't like that. Um, you know, it could potentially also frighten the small blind from uh, off of a hand like sevens. So I think something like 60 or even smaller represents still a lot of strength and... Um, still gets us into that profitable situation with a small blind, maybe even a bit more often. So I think that's a ton of the value of squeezing jacks here, so it would be a shame to miss out on that. So we squeeze to 65, under the gun player calls. Uh, I think actually his calling range here is going to be extremely strong if he has any clue at all what's happening. And that's because he should realize that we're not bluffing here very often given the small blind. Or, you know, that's probably, I guess, like a level one thinking, or level one way of thinking about it. We're not bluffing very often, because we know the small blind's going to continue very often. So it's unlikely that we have much air to go with our range. So if he's calling here, he knows that we have a strong hand, 
and he knows that it's pretty unlikely that the small blind is going to fold behind him. So it's not like he can float the flop and take it down a lot of the time because the small blind might just check raise all in with any piece. So for him to call, he's going to have a very strong range. And when he does call, I think it's a lot less likely as ace king in general, just because it's tough to see a showdown with only ace high um, in a rear ace pot like this, especially when you're facing such a polarized range from um, the big blind re raiser, often what is a polarized range. You know, given what we said about the small blind, I think that plays a lot into the decision to flat. Um, and I would say because it's less likely it's ace-king, and we know it's very likely he has a, a strong hand, like, um, you know, a pair better than ours, I would guess, a lot of the time. Um, I would proceed post-flop with a lot of caution and uh, not really enjoy the spot. And that's kind of a reason why not to squeeze jacks. And I was talking about 10s and 9s being a bit thinner as well. But before you guys are saying like, oh, this is a terrible play, you have to realize just how valuable it is to get all that money in pre-flop against the small blinds range. So I think this is a no-brainer squeeze pre-flop with, you know, perhaps the beginning of an unfortunate result. So booyah, don't have to worry about that anymore. So we flop top set. Uh, I have a few options. We could just go ahead and bet like, what, uh, about about 60. Um, yeah, probably about half pot, about 75, which will set up uh, stacks pretty nicely for a pot size turn shove. So uh, betting, betting maybe like 80 would be a bit better, just so we can go like two thirds pot, two thirds pot-ish, uh, 80 or 90, and then that way, it uh, it puts our opponent in a pretty rough spot if we do have a lot of air here. But again, I don't think he should be reading our range as that. So our continuation bet would actually be extremely strong. And I don't think, again, any player you know who has a clue what's going on here is going to continue with even ace-king if we continuation bet in this spot. So uh, when we do bet... I would think from the under the guns point of view, unless he just views us as spewing, even a hand like pocket queens or kings are actually in a pretty gross spot if you really think about our range, because he's either really against jacks, uh, queens, or a hand that beats him if he, he does have queens. So it's just not many favorable outcomes. And there's two cards to come on a draw a board. You know, maybe best case scenario, we have like ace king of clubs. So um, then especially if we're giving up some of the time as well, uh, not just continuation betting this board always. But there's there's basically a lot of things that happen pre-flop that show our range is probably uh, exploitively strong. And by that I mean we don't have a lot of air in our range with which to continuation bet. So if we do bet, it just looks stupid strong. And a good player is going to play well against that by folding uh, more hands than, you know, a bad player would. So I think in general, um, I would bet here roughly half the time, I would say, because you definitely do want to bet your strong hands here, and then you do want to continuation bet air some of the time. But checking here is a great way to add deception to your game. And also put your opponent in some weird spots where he thinks, you know, for sure his hand's good. Maybe sometimes we have pocket tens, so we're trying to protect against uh, against check folding that always, or check folding always rather after we squeeze. And then sometimes we do want to give up with a hand like ace king. And um, you know, if we if we maybe can check down and chop the pot or beat ace queen suited, if the under the gun player did defend that then that's an awesome result too. So uh, for that to happen, we need to make his bluffs unprofitable. And to do that, we need to check some good hands. So checking jacks here, I think is good. There aren't going to be many hands um, in his range that have a lot of equity against jacks. Um, about the best he can do is a, a two outer, really. So we're not really worried about, um, about anything here. So I would say, oh, check because his calling range, like we said, is pretty pretty tight. Um, when we do check, the under-the-gun player bets 75, 
And I think going all in uh, right away is fine because it balances with semi bluffs. Um, but we said there just aren't that many semi bluffs that we could have. I mean, you know, what club draws are we willing to get all in pre flop with a small blind? There's maybe like two combinations of club draws uh, ace king of clubs and ace queen of clubs. So it doesn't really look like, um, you know, assuming the small blind's a weaker player that we can represent a lot of semi-bluffs by check-raising. And another thing is he's not really going to be bet-folding that many hands given how strong his range is. So I do like the check call, I think, a little bit more than a check-raise, uh, just because check-raising is insanely strong. I mean, I would, I would think as ridiculous as this sounds that if the under-the-gun player bet-folded kings that it'd probably be a good play. Um, given the flop bet, but that likely just means that the flop bet is a poor decision. So anyway, getting a, a bit rambly on the flop, you know, but I think the check call is good, and we can just keep pretending like we have tens or queens and uh, play the turn pretty well. So the turn is a pretty gross card because our range is now, you know, insanely strong. I mean, the worst we can have is queens, which is an overpair and an open-ended straight draw, and sometimes we're going to have a straight flush draw to go with it. Uh, so if the under-the-gun player even shoved kings here, it'd be pretty surprising and spewy. Uh, kings are aces. I don't think it's a, a good value bet. Maybe uh, kings are aces with a club would be fine, but I think in general he's just getting snapped by a really, really strong range. And at best, you know, he's like a, a two to one favorite, maybe not even that um, if he doesn't have a club. So checking here, I think, though, is definitely the play. It's just an unfortunate turn. If we lead into him, our range looks even stronger. So I think a lead here with about anything is just not a good idea. Um, what should happen is the turn goes check, check most of the time. What will happen, I would say is the under-the-gun player is just going to hate life and not really think about what our range is. He's going to be really mad that his kings probably aren't the best ten, but that's not going to stop him from going all in with kings or aces, I would say, uh, at least in my experience. So we check. He goes all in. Definitely a no-brainer call. Um, you know, we have to fade a lot of rivers, I'm sure, but we are way ahead of his shoving range here in my experience. So uh, we show, and he has 3-4 of clubs, which completely threw me for a loop. Um, I guess the under-the-gun player is just a god-awful fish. So I didn't actually uh, see the results of the hand until um, just now with you guys. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Is this the type of play that you're used to? Because I'm definitely not, and I actually just going to fly to Canada right now to play in this game. So I will uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. I'll see you in the comment section. If you want some more uh, free strategy, it's actually a bit higher quality than what you'll find here on the, uh, the YouTube channel, in my opinion. Uh, check out the Transform Poker blog. It's at blog.transformpoker.com. Or I'll put a, uh, a link in the description for you guys. So take care, guys. I'll see you next time.